The Transpose D40, if you don't know about it already, then you probably should. If you're into ATX cases that are small, this thing is not as small as you can get, but out of the 300 plus cases that I track in order to uh, compare and rate compatibility and specification of cases I review, it is the fourth smallest ATX case on the board, which is doing something right. Unfortunately, it's not doing everything right. I do have my gripes, but if you can look past those, you can see what I say or hear what I say and say, doesn't bother me, then this one's a great one and you should uh, keep your eye out for it if it goes on sale. More on that in a little bit. You know what, let's cut it there, get straight into the review. If you like what you see, then make sure to like and subscribe if you want to support me making more of this stuff in the future. Not much to say about the packaging. The box it came in had quite the lower dent, but the protection inside is your premium closed cell foam, which seemed to avoid any damage. Getting into an overview, this case has a very non-standard layout that might appeal to quite a few of you out there. Yes, the front is completely sealed, but the front is not part of this case's intake ventilation, but it still plays a role in the cooling strategy, which we'll cover in detail throughout the first part of this video. The front naturally houses the front IO, consisting of a power button with surrounding LED power and drive activity LED diffuser. We've also got a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A port, mic and headphone jack, and a USB Type C port, so overall a pretty modern setup. Well, sort of. It's worth noting that both USB ports terminate at the same 3.2 Gen 1 connector. There's no specific Type-C 3.2 Gen 2 connector or similar for that Type-C port, so you won't be getting the fastest data rates out of your super fast Type-C devices if that's something that's very important to you. Something that stands out as a little strange is the choice of materials for this case. The front and rear are 1.5mm thick aluminium panels or aluminium panels that measure as 1.8mm after coatings. That's not very strange, but the offside panel is 1.6 millimeter thick steel after coatings, way above the 0.6 millimeter measurement from the website. Perhaps a typo there. This results in possibly the heaviest steel panel I've come across on a case. At 1.6 kilos, I'd hazard to guess this single panel is potentially as heavy as the total weight of the lightest PC case on the market whatever that might be. It's a lot heavier than the 3mm glass side panel of the D40, and even slightly heavier than the 4mm glass side panel of the pretty sizable Lian Li Lancool 2 mesh. If I'm going to be critical in this review, and I intend to be, I'd ask the question, why? It doesn't need to be this heavy, and following that expensive, weight adds on to everything, and with the limited grip space, it makes the panel less manageable when replacing it. I think this could be a case of a lack of time to optimize the design before launch, I'm struggling to think of another reason, and since it's not a deal breaker, just a quirky decision, let's maybe not dwell on it any further. Actually, let's for one more second. The panel has ventilation to the central section, and it's filtered, but there's no support for fans behind it. All it's really doing is providing some extra ventilation for the rear of the motherboard, or the rear of the CPU socket. But since there's not really any airflow in this region, and it's already tight enough back there as it is, its purpose is very limited. I question, is there really much requirement for ventilation to the rear of the motherboard? Most cases don't have it, and I haven't really seen a problem with that, so yeah. Anyway, moving on. Working around to the rear panel, this is very different to most cases in so many respects. Firstly, from a design perspective, the corners are rounded, not square. But more significantly, there's no power supply unit position back here. But there is a power connector to the top that's a pass-through to the internal power supply unit position to the top front side of the case. This does mean to access the power supply switch, the top panel does need to be removed. Nah, an extra step. While we're on the top panel, the internal filter is, in my opinion, a bit of a botched job. It's fine and functions perfectly well, but most of the cases either have a higher quality removable filter of sorts, something with maybe a frame made of a thick, but maybe flexible perforated plastic sheet, or some sort of perforated steel panel. The D40 has a pretty thin plastic mesh that's plastic welded, but welded, to the plastic top panel. It's a little rough around the edges, and 
isn't designed to be removed and replaced, but it does the job, so make of it what you will. Anyway, back to the rear. With the power supply position elsewhere, significantly reducing the height of this case, the PCI Express slots are right at the base of the case, and these are unusual ones. The slot covers are completely sealed. Not, not like the cheap ones that you punch out and they're mostly, they're completely sealed and removable. I've criticized poor PCI Express slot cover ventilation areas before, like those on the NSI Forge 100R and the Aerocool Aero 1, Eclipse Aero 1, as they reduce the airflow around the graphics card. But this is something else, which is right. Taking a look at the base, it's fully ventilated and filtered. Now, the filter is missing some of the creature comforts that most other cases in this price range will provide. It doesn't slide out of the front or side, well, at least not easily. Instead, it needs flexing into position, into those slats provided, and the feet when they're on there, which require you to tip the case every time you want to clean the filter. Not unless you can get a feel for that flexing into place without having to completely tip it, but you know. Not ideal if your final system is heavy and wedged under your desk. There are also cutouts in the filter and grommets in the chassis for a base mounted 2.5 inch or 3.5 inch drive. But all that ventilation counts for naught if there's no clearance from the surface it rests on. This is the first case I've ever encountered that doesn't have the feet pre-attached to the main assembly. They come in the parts bag, which we'll cover in a second, and need screwing to the base of the case. They're plastic feet with foam pads, ideal for sliding around a case on hard surfaces. So back to the PCI Express lock covers. With these and the front panel sealed, they've created essentially a duct that forces intake airflow from below through the PCI Express lock section and not out the back, but up to the CPU cooler and motherboard section. They've clearly thought twice about this strategy. It's nice to see. The question is, should you vent from the top or the rear or the top front? Stay tuned for the testing part to find out. I didn't actually manage to get uh, back to front testing, but I do explain that a little later. So. Stay tuned. While we're talking about the cooling strategy, make sure to check out the on-screen visuals for compatibility info. Good radiator support on this one relative to its size. So let's get into the build. I'll cover the highs and lows and leave the very average stuff aside to save time as best as I can. Starting with the power supply knit, it's kind of a tricky one. There's plenty of space to move into position at the front of the case, but since it's mounted to the top and slightly offset from the front, you will need to constantly support it with one hand while adding the screws with the other. Ideally, you'll want a magnetic screwdriver to make this easier, and that's not a tall order for a lot of people, so. I'm not going to grab too much about it. The pass-through cable from the rear through to the front gives you enough slack for power supply units with the socket mounted to either side of the unit. You could mount it fan side forward, but I'd suggest mounting it fan side backward to just make the airflow path a little easier towards the top of the case and keeping the power supply in it a touch cooler. Power supply unit fans don't spin very fast in most scenarios, so it's nigh on impossible that you'll starve your CPU cooler of airflow, so don't be too concerned with that. Let's cover the cable management next. It's a little rough in this one. There are buckets of cable management space, don't get me wrong, but it's all on show to the front of the main compartment. Well, clarifying that and correcting the compartment comment, there's not really much of a rear compartment or much of any usable room behind the motherboard tray where you might expect space for cables. You couldn't even fit a two and a half inch drive flat against the back of the, the uh, motherboard tray if you wanted to. So yes, all of the cables just dangle in the front of the case. You can mask it with a two and a half inch drive panel and if you have two and a half inch drives, that can look pretty cool. I don't think it looks all that good without a couple of drives to spice up the relatively on the nose visual barrier, but that's just me. Something rather conspicuous by its absence are grommets to the cable management holes in the motherboard tray to clean up the appearance through from the rear. Not the end of the world, just something that I'd expect seeing that the case is at its price point of, well, I think I bought it for £90, something like $110 worth-ish. It's quite a lot for no grommets included. But we do get this mini duct to the top, which is nice, so I guess we're even. Let's cover the drives now. Not too much to say here. To the front panel, you've got two spots for two and a half inch drives. To the base, you've got that position seen earlier for a two and a half inch or three and a half inch drive. Now, all those drive positions use the standard screw through a panel installation method, although I do fully appreciate the groove cutout of the side panel to allow screws to make it through the uh, past the return properly. It, it's a nice feature. 
Nice addition. They thought about it. But the fourth and final drive position uses the best drive mounting technique of them all, the grommet and screw method. I'm sort of surprised you don't see three and a half inch drives mounted using this technique since the rubber grommet would provide some damping to vibration. Maybe I'm missing something. I have seen some shoddy drive cages that rattle around a lot more than that would though, so I... I am surprised not to see it. Anyway, I've placed some liberal estimations on storage capacities to the top of top corner of the info border. The D40 has very good storage for plenty of SSDs if you're into that sort of thing, but not so much for those with copious amounts of data that need three and a half inch drives. Moving on to the motherboard and CPU cooler, the motherboard installation was straightforward. No issue with the rear IO cover and with the radiator capacity to the top, there was plenty of clearance for the board to slide in and plenty of clearance to plug in the CPU power connector and stuff with your hand, especially with the completely see-through bit from the top, that's just very good. No side of a standoff post to help align the board, but that's not exactly a necessity. As for the CPU cooler, there's loads of support for any massive CPU cooler you could want, apart from one or two, but they're not exactly amazing anyway. There's also good access to the rear of the board for in-situ installation too, not that I necessarily recommend it, but for future stuff, nice to have. As for the graphics card installation, they've opted for the sensible standard screw instead of those fiddly thumb screws wedged into awkward corners like these. The installation was simple, but the dimensions available to you need a, a little clarification on my part. To the bottom of the screen are the graphics card compatibility notes. On the left are the dimensions. The length on the left set is a measurement of the length of the graphics card plus the horizontal difference distance from the graphics card to the face of my very standard power supply unit. It's nice to know, but it's only strictly relevant if you went for a really long 200 millimeter power supply unit. The length measurement on the right is the graphics card length plus the distance to the front panel, which is more relevant but you should take these dimensions with a pinch of salt since the more you push beyond the left dimension of 298 millimeters, the more you move into the cable termination zone of the power supply unit. So I'd focus on the 298 millimeters as your soft maximum and definitely stop at a hard maximum of 310 millimeters. Otherwise, otherwise you might get into trouble with the power supply unit cables. So here we are. Last thing to cover is the parts box and a couple of minor quibbles. You get all the screws you need for a build and the drive screws are nicely parted out, but I think some optimization has been left on the table in the form of three different sets of two and a half inch drive or SSD screws. I mean, it's fine, but it's, it's messy. To get the bad news out of the way, if you wanted to use the rear as an intake, which would make some sense, you could have a couple of intakes to the base, one to the rear, flip the CPU cooler around to exhaust towards the rear and throw an exhaust to the top front position, which would work alongside the power supply unit as an additional exhaust. Could be good, but that would mean you've got an unfiltered intake so you'd get faster dust buildup. Luckily, John's bow have covered you or partially covered the rear of the case with a rear filter consisting of some plastic mesh and some doubles back sticky tape. I mean, it's a solution, but we've all used double back tape and unless it's a relatively thick one, they don't work on many surfaces and the rougher texture of this case, as much as I like it, isn't ideal for a thinner double back tape solution in my opinion. Either way, this is a pretty last minute phone in solution, not something you'd expect to see on a relatively pricey case like this one. Speaking of the paint job, another minor quibble I spotted was the slightly lacking internal paint job to the front. It's not the end of the world by any means, it's just noticeable when you look as closely as you might do when making a YouTube video, but it's more of an FYI than, than anything. You won't notice it. You just won't. Anyway, now let's discuss the thermal and acoustic performance. Firstly, the stock full fan speed testing performance was awful since this case comes with no case fans. I mean, it's quiet, but to a fault. So I advise getting some case fans if you plan on installing any system you plan to push at least moderately. So let's move on to installing some fans and trying out some noise normalized testing. Some of you might have spotted a post of mine recently relating to this. So this is the great premiere of my testing setup example visual 
thing. Due to the non-standard cooling configuration of this case, two base intakes seem to be the most sensible place to start. Intakes are by their nature restricted by filters, so more intakes than exhaust is typically a reasonable approach. After that, I tested two different exhaust setups. The first was a rear exhaust working with the CPU cooler's fan and further assisting the graphics card. And the second was placing the exhaust up top, which is perpendicular to the CPU cooler's fan and airflow created by that fan, and is also away from the graphics card and exhausting through a fixed top panel filter, which is far from the free area afforded to the rear exhaust position. I mean, look at the free, look at the size of those circle cutouts, the holes loads of free area. Unfortunately, I didn't feel I had the time to test another setup that I think could be good. It's the one I mentioned earlier, rear intake with the awful filter, optional I guess, but we want to try and filter it. Anyway, with the awful filter, flip the CPU cooler's fan exhausting forward, top front exhaust working with the power supply in it, and one or two base intakes. I limit the case testing fans to three to be reasonable. I think this setup idea is good, but I'm not a fan of turning an unfiltered exhaust into a filtered intake. It just cuts down the free area, which will result in more noise and less airflow. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the artist's impression, or my artist's impression, of particle-y in simulation-y thing there. I think it looks interesting and gives an impression of how the airflow runs through the case. So anyway, how did those two setups perform? Well, long story short, the two base intakes with the rear exhaust fairly significantly outperforms the two base intakes with the top exhaust. At least that's mainly true for the CPU temperatures over the GPU temperatures with the full load of Prouty 5, also known as the light blue bars. The GPU performance isn't that different in performance across the two setups. There is potentially some performance improvement in line with the CPU thermal performance change, but we're quibbling over a degree, so nothing to write home about. And that seems to make sense since both setups provide airflow coverage across the entire graphics card, but the CPU thermal change between the parallel and perpendicular fans is certainly worth noting. Both setups were outputting 37.5 dBA and also happen to have the fans running at the same nice PWM percentage, if not the same speed on average across the three, three fans. There was a little speed lost on that top filter exhaust, but again, nothing to write home about. Taking the better performing setup forward and comparing it to other cases, its performance is well, it's not not great. The stock performance, again, is bad. It's in the red, which means it crashed due to runaway CPU temps past 100 degrees. It's worse than the Pop Mini Silent, but to be fair, that's more of an indic in in indictment? indictment of the Pop Mini Silent than anything else. It came with three fans, and still pretty much failed miserably. Moving on to the noise normalized testing, the D40 and Pop Mini Silent are still together, but they've swapped around. Note the fans in the Pop Mini Silent are the test fans, since the stock fans weren't loud or fast slash loud enough uh, to meet the noise target of 37.5 dBA at 40 centimeters from the front corner of the case. It's hard to not say all of that at the same time because it is important. Anyway, for all intents and purposes, both cases have the exact same fans, albeit in a slightly different configuration and they're completely different cases with completely different configurations too. I think the takeaway from these results is that for a case that has a sealed front but diverts the responsibility of intake to the base with a 13 millimeter clearance provided by the feet, it's only just performing better than a case that's way more sealed off and tries its best to force the airflow through a slit to the side of the front panel. By that I mean it's surprising how much more open the intake of the D40 is, but how it doesn't seem to make the most of it. Before closing out the thermal performance criticism, I think it's worth stating that it is possible to have a case as small as this and manage to perform well. The Meshify 2 Mini is a good example of this. It's a touch smaller overall and required fewer additional fans to perform better. So anyway, let's wrap this up with a conclusion summarizing everything. Starting with the spec versus volume or compatibility versus volume if you want, the Johnsbo D40 is top of the page scoring good compatibility consistently across the component types. It falls a little short in the drive section, but that only really goes higher if a case is very drive oriented, so relatively it's not doing too badly. However, that's not the end of specification scoring on 
for me at least anyway, since many cases come with fans and this one doesn't. For instance, the Torrent Compact comes with two high quality 180mm fans so it gets a high bump in its score. I might need to optimize the weighting of those scores a touch, but regardless, since the D40 comes with bugger all, it gets lost in the pack a little and ends up with 4.9 out of 10. Which seems a little harsh, but there aren't any fans and you will absolutely need some, so that's what it gets. How about the build quality? Well, the D40 easily takes a 10 in the solid panel composition score. I mean, you can't beat that panel. You can't, it will beat you back, so it has to get a 10. But solid panel composition isn't the be all and end all of a case, unfortunately, for John's bow, uh, pretending that like they actually care about the scoring in this review. The D40 falls down in a few areas, the biggest disappointment being the filters that are essentially just structureless plastic, and it's pretty average in the glass panel thickness department, paint and finish, and drive support quality. Just screws. None of the cool special stuff. Anyway, all in all, 6.4 out of 10. Not bad, but nothing to write home about. Installation E score. Here's the breakdown. They are in order of score, but some cases don't have certain elements, so they don't get rated. But on average, across all these elements, here's how they get laid out. The D40 scores really well overall. Sure, it does look low on the list, but that's mainly because cases are pretty easy to build in. The main letdown are the filters again, the maintenance is just a nightmare with them. Also the power supply unit which requires three hands for an easy installation, two hands for a slightly awkward installation. I'm just thinking about people with maybe dexterity issues. I'm sure the average person will be able to figure it out without too much fuss. So yeah, 8.3 out of 10, a great score. And last but not least, all the thermal performance results mathematically bundled into a score. The D40 gets 4.3 out of 10. Since half the score is the stock performance, it was always going to take a big hit. But hey, maybe that's okay if the lack of fans is reflected in the price. Just before that, here's the total score breakdown, and after bonus and penalty points, the D4 getting none of either, here's the final score, 6 out of 10. I know, it, it sounds quite mean, but I've been through all the parameters, each component, and judged them on the same set of criteria as all the other cases I test, and that's what the score came out to be on the other side. Yeah. But the price could save it. Sorry there, I misspoke. The price could have saved it. I couldn't find this on sale in the US, but from pounds to dollars, it's about $110, which is very nearly the most expensive case on the board. So. Lo and behold, it has the second worst price versus score. Now here's the thing, this case stands out on the list in one big way. And ironically, the big way is just how small it is for an ATX case. In my 300 plus list of cases used for rating the specs of cases in these reviews, covering all the extremes, this is the fourth smallest ATX case. That's the fourth smallest out of all 166 ATX cases on the list, the other ones being Micro ATX and ITX. That is one hell of an achievement. And on top of that, out of those four, it has the second highest compatibility score. And at that, it's in the top 10% of all highest compatibility scores relative to, vo relative to volume out of all cases, out of all the ATX, Micro ATX, and ITX cases. This thing is a beast. All I need to do to get a full recommendation from me uh, to you is to do at least some of these suggestions. Reduce the price a little to make it more competitive by $20 if at all possible. That's still, yeah. For what it is, potentially competitive. Improve the filters. There are little to no excuses for filters to be that phoned in on such an expensive case. I would say include some stock fans, but I know many people would prefer no fans at a reduced price point so they can get better ones separately than would come with a case, and that's completely fair. But until they do that, I can only recommend this, this case to anyone who can overlook the issues I've outlined in this review, and I'm sure many can. ATX cases don't often get as dense as this, so it's clearly going to be valuable to quite a few of you out there. Speaking of which, if you know a case that I should pay some serious attention to, please let me know in the comments, and why not give the video a like? while you're at it. I have another plan to reduce the size of my reviews in the future, so subscribe if you have any faith that'll be worth seeing or just want to support more of 
what I'm doing. Thanks to the poor sod supporting me on Patreon, I would be making more extra sort of behind the scenes stuff over there, but work has been kicking my ass lately with super tight deadlines, so I've barely got enough energy at the end of the day to spend hours working on this, let alone bonus content, so apologies for that. Hopefully this won't last forever and we can get back to some consistent uploads soon once again. Thanks everyone for clicking on this video, for taking the time and checking out my stuff, and I'll catch you in the next one.